Hi, it's Bill, and I'm here with Don. Here's Don. Hi. And what I wanted to talk to you about in the next 10 or 15 minutes was the long history of alternative and complementary currency experiments. Now, when you think about things like Bitcoin or other kinds of cryptographic and digital currencies that we're hearing a lot about right now in the media and seeing out there in the tech world, you might think this is a wholly new thing. No one's ever thought to create a new money before. No one's ever thought to try to make money that's separate from the state or separate from what's known as fiat money invented by the state. But in fact, there's quite a long history in the United States and around the world of what we call alternative and complementary currencies. And let me just put that on the board. Now, people who talk about alternative currencies generally mean that you're creating an entire currency and an entire economic system that's going to be separate from the dominant economy. So we have a dominant economy in which we transact in US dollars, right? And Don and I are buying things and selling things every day using dollars or dollar denominated accounts or our credit cards or whatever. Um, and that's the economy that we see around us out here in the wider world. People who are thinking about alternative currencies for the past 200 or so years have been imagining what would it be like if we created a whole new money based on entirely different principles that then existed apart in a whole separate realm, in a whole separate economy um, from the dominant economy. Now that's, that's a little different from the people who imagine complementary currencies. People who are thinking about complementary currencies tend to say, you know, we have the dominant economy, it has its own money, and that's fine, but sometimes we want to supplement that with another kind of money um, that helps us do the sorts of things and earn value and make money in the kinds of things that the economy doesn't generally recognize. So think about all the kinds of work that you engage in or all the kinds of products that are out there in the world that you can't really buy or sell or that are really hard to put a price tag on. Things like childcare, things like emotional labor, Things like just helping a friend fix their computer or helping a neighbor fix their fence. There have been a lot of people throughout the past couple of hundred years who have thought, you know, we'd have a better functioning economy and we'd be able to help each other out in times of need if we had a complementary currency um, in which we could value those kinds of activities. Set up a whole new kind of trading network, if you will, um, based on some of the stuff that we're doing every day for each other, um, kind of out of the goodness of our hearts. Now, why would we want to monetize that? Why would we want to make that into a commodity? That's a really good question. Um, some people think that if we did that, then those activities that currently go uncompensated would rise in value more generally in society. So take something like housework, right? People aren't paid to pick up their room. People aren't paid to do the dishes at home unless you have a servant. And a servant's labor is very low valued. Well, what if people were actually compensated for the work that they do um, in the home? What if there were wages for housework? This was a very active debate in this country in the 1960s and early 1970s. It didn't really go anywhere, um, but you know, it still raised the issue of do we need to think about a kind of complementary currency or an alternative means of valuing some of the activities that currently go uncompensated? So these folks, the alternative currency people, are generally pretty utopian. Right? They're thinking about creating a whole new economic world. These folks, I would say, are kind of the pragmatists. Right? They're like, well, we live in the world. It's just that there are some parts of the world where we feel that if we had another money, if we had another way of ascribing value to things, we might be able to do more and lead more fulfilling lives and have more rewarding and economically productive lives. Now, let me just tell you about a few examples of of these kinds of things. And you know, I think at the end of the day, there are very few good examples of true alternatives because it is hard to kind of imagine you can step outside the world and be in a wholly different world. We have to interact with other people. After all, we have to get along in the world that, that, that we're in. So often things that start out as alternative currency systems gradually kind of become complementary systems. I'll give you an example of that in a second. But first, um, you know, we currently live in a country and in an economy um, that runs around the US dollar. And we tend to forget 
that the US dollar was actually quite a feat to accomplish, to create one currency for this vast nation that everybody would accept, that all banks would accept deposits in terms of, that all people would be willing to be paid in terms of, and that would all be uh, backed by um, the full faith and credit of the US government. But that was an achievement. It, it wasn't really until you know after the Civil War in this country when there were huge debates over the nature of the currency and over whether currency should be backed by the government or backed by gold or backed by silver or backed by some combination of the two. It wasn't until all those debates happened and then resolved themselves around the turn of the century, um, basically around 1900 to 1913, that we got one unified national currency, the US dollar, right, that you all are familiar with. What did we have before? Well, one of the things we had before was banks around the country issuing their own money. And I have an example of that right here. This is a banknote that says $1 from the Bank of DeSoto. This is a um, bank somewhere in the middle of the country. I'm not sure where. Um, this is from the, the 1860s, 1870s. And the Bank of DeSoto just decided, you know what? We've got people's deposits here on our account. We can issue banknotes backed by those deposits. And if people are willing to use these and spend these, then hey presto, it's money. You had a lot of this going on in the 19th century in the US. A lot of banks all over the country issuing their own currency, issuing their own notes. Now think about what some of the benefits of this were. Some of the benefits were, well, if you're in a place in the 19th century like Missouri, which to us sounds like the middle of the country, but back then is like far out west, right? Middle of nowheresville. If you're in a place like Missouri, money, US dollars money, are going to be hard to come by, right? There might be scarcities of money. So if you have your own little local bank, why not leverage the assets of that bank to print your own notes and get people in your community to start using them, right? It solves a problem of transport. You don't have to transport these bills from the big banks in New York City all the way to Missouri. You don't have to worry about relationships with other banks or exchanging them with other banks. You got them right here. Now, what's the problem? Well, of course, the big problem is, what if I'm the banker at the Bank of DeSoto and I just decide to say, hey, 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 I'm going to print a whole lot of these and just issue them to everybody and um, send them out around the countryside when, in fact, they're not actually backed by anything at all. Right? I can make a killing by getting people to start using these and treating these as money um, as long as then somehow I'm benefiting from the lending activity that's taking place or the additional commerce that's taking place and so on but these might be worthless. One of the reasons why we had the consolidation of the US currency, one of the reasons why we had the Federal Reserve Act um, in 1913 was precisely to stamp out this kind of practice because of the risks involved. Um, so that's one example. I will give it to Don and he will look at it. <laughs> um, just fast forwarding in history, Closer to us in time, there have been other examples since the consolidation of the US dollar of communities trying to create an alternative currency and an alternative economy that gradually sort of transformed itself into a complementary economy. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, in Ithaca, New York, which is a town in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region, it's the home to Cornell University and Ithaca Woo! College. Um, there was a shout out for Cornell just now. Uh, <clears throat> for a number of years in the 70s and 80s, there was a network of friends who engaged in barter with each other. Whenever they needed something done that one of their friends could do, instead of going and hiring a contractor or hiring a babysitter or hiring a gardener or whatever, they would look to their network of friends um, and exchange their expertise, um, exchange uh, labor. Um, and just kept track of it in a, literally in a notebook. This is before computers. This is sort of before the internet. You had a kind of, of ledger book. And you would just say, you know, on such and such a date, Don gave Bill one hour of labor um, working in Bill's garden. And someone would sit with this ledger book and keep track of who was doing what for whom, tally it up in terms of hours, and try to make sure that people were balancing out over time so that it wasn't a situation where I had all these people doing labor for me, but I was never doing stuff for somebody else. The person with the ledger book 
if they saw that there was this slouch Bill who was so demanding of other people but never did anything for them, would call Bill up, call me up and say, hey, like you really should get out there and do stuff for your pals because I can see here that they've contributed so many hours of labor to you. Um, this was what was called a local exchange and trading system, or LETS. These were very popular um, in the United States, Canada, uh, and in uh, the UK, and they spread to the rest of the English-speaking world and elsewhere, particularly in the 70s and 80s during um, our last big bouts of economic recession. Um, why? Well, people didn't have money to get the things done that they needed to get done, so they started relying on their friends and creating these barter networks. Okay. The thing was, in Ithaca, something started to happen, and this starts to happen in a lot of let systems. What started to happen was, you have a whole lot of people um, labor sharing with each other at the beginning, but then the amount of activity slowly starts to dip off. Um, and when you talk to people back then about why their level of activi activity in the system started to let up a bit, they would say things like, um, they really enjoyed the system, it was really giving them terrific benefits, it was enabling them to keep some of their hard-earned cash in their pockets and use that to pay the bills, but then get some of the other things of life done in this system. However, they started to feel really indebted to other people, and they didn't like that feeling. Um, they started to feel guilty. They started to feel that maybe they were asking too much of their neighbors, or any time they would ask someone to do something for them, well, then the next thing that was going to happen was if they didn't do something for somebody else, the person holding this ledger was going to give them a call and kind of lay a guilt trip on them and say, you know, you really should contribute. You've only given a couple of hours this month, and, you know, you've absorbed, like, 20 hours of labor. They also didn't like the feeling that there was some person here keeping track of who was doing everything for everybody else. This is not particularly anonymous, right? It made them feel a little creeped out that here's this centralized ledger book that any, anybody could look at in theory, um, held by a central accountant that's recording all of their transactions. They didn't like that some of their personal affairs were out there in a different way in the community. Now, it may seem a little strange to hear this because obviously these are people who in the beginning were gung-ho on the idea of bartering, on the idea of sharing with one another, but once it went on for some time, kind of enthusiasm cooled. So some of the people who were behind the, the let system in Ithaca hit on an idea. They said, you know, instead of having this system where there's a centralized ledger, um, instead of having a system where um, people basically know who's doing what for whom, what if we created a new technology that would allow for all of this to happen, but to happen anonymously? And you might be able to guess what new technology they hit upon. What they hit upon was a paper note, just like the US dollar. And they started printing their own money. Um, I have some examples here of Ithaca hours. These are no longer in circulation. This is a one-eighth hour note. Um, each hour is equivalent to one hour of labor. This is a half hour. So with this, I could get a half an hour of somebody's time doing whatever it is that they would do for me. Um, here is a full one hour note. You'll see that it has been canceled. <laughs> These things only circulate for a period of time um, before the folks running the system who basically ran it out of a used bookstore would call them in and um, collect them in mainly in payments to the bookstore and then cancel them and issue new notes as they got worn. Um, and here's down to a quarter hour. Now, you might ask, you know, so great, they print their own money, but what's the guarantee that anybody's going to accept this thing? Why would anybody take this instead of a US dollar? Well, one of the things that they did to try to motivate people is they got a couple of big players in the town involved. A big cooperative supermarket and one of the credit unions, the Alternatives Federal Credit Union, both of which agreed to pay their employees partly in hours if the employee wanted to. And the credit union also agreed to accept deposits in these notes in Ithaca hours. Now, the next thing you might ask is, well, you know, if I'm going to go to the Walmart, can I use one of those things? And the answer is no. Um, you could only use them in stores and with people who agreed um, to accept them. Well, how am I going to know who agrees to accept them? What they did was they printed a newsletter. Um, 
here is an issue of the newsletter from the year 2000. Um, it's really remarkable to think that you know this really isn't very long ago that you would have these kind of daily circulating in small communities um, in general, but in particular for this kind of function. This is the Our Town newsletter. What you would do is you'd go and pick one of these up. They were for free around town. And you'd, um, there'd be some news and information. And then you could look and see what people were willing to accept Ithaca Hours for, what they were willing to accept that, that alternative currency or complementary currency for. And you see how one of the things that's happened is that it started out as an alternative system. We're going to have our own little separate barter economy. But it turns into very quickly a complementary system where it's complementing the rest of the economy. So I can look here. Oh, I think that Don has a question. I just had a comment. When I used to live in Ithaca, Ben and Jerry's would take Ithaca hours. Oh, I didn't know that. They That's capped great. how many they would take in a day. Uh -huh. But they would take them. Well, here, you can look and you can see what I can get. So I can, uh, here is data analysis and data processing, daycare, delicatessens, and it looks like there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 delicatessens in Ithaca that would accept Ithaca hours. Here's a dentist. Um, the dentist says that he will only accept a maximum of one hour with a 25% discount for children's checkups and cleanings. <laughs> there are two DJs if you need a dish jockey for your party. Um, there are a number of educational services. There's an electrolysis center if you need permanent hair removal. Well, you get the idea, right? The whole range of products and services are in here. And for business owners, one of the reasons that they agreed to participate in this is purely for foot traffic, right? This is bringing people into the shop. It's participating in the spirit of a kind of local community. And in a way, um, really helped downtown Ithaca revivify itself in the wake of some of the big, um, big box shops that came into town just on the outskirts of town. This became a way to symbolize your commitment to the community and to keep your money flowing locally.